This is The Dragon's Roar by Priestess of Groove, narrated by Riley Rocks. Chapter 49 Catelyn 2 and Daenerys 4 Catelyn Catelyn stared wistfully as Bran, a handful of men, Mira, and Jojen Reed trotted out of the gate for a hunt. Bran's dire wolf Storm loped behind him, so named due to the wolf howling in time with the thunder of a rare summer storm. A tug on her dress jarred her from her thoughts as she looked down at Rickon's teary eyes. I want to go on a hunt. You're not quite old enough, my darling. One day, you'll be hunting with the best of them soon. You'll see. She ran a hand through his hair, but he scowled and wandered off, kicking rocks as he came to them. Shaggy Dog yipped and trotted in step with him. She sighed. Rickon was having trouble adjusting to the emptiness of Winterfell. For that matter, so was she. There were only a handful of servants in the yard now, and Catelyn B. to haste her retreat. She steered herself toward the glass gardens. Perhaps a walk amongst the flowers would soothe her heartsickness. Ned, her firstborn, and her beautiful girls had left Winterfell seven months prior for war. Some war, she thought. By some miracle of the gods, King Aemon Targaryen, with his hand, Lord Jaime Lannister, had swept up the Seven Kingdoms in a bloodless tangle of alliances. She would admit to being impressed. If there was no further proof of the Seven, this would be enough to satisfy that. And yet, she was unsettled. It was too good. Too easy. Lord Jamie Lannister had indeed been successful at securing the Westerlands in the Reach. Rob was to be married in two months, and little Sansa would be wed in two years. It baffled her that the Kingslayer, for that's what he'd always be, would secure Aemon's allies with marriages, not even from his own family, but all for the sole benefit of House Stark. It was suspicious, to say the least. There had to be an ulterior motive— was this a trap? She had turned it over in her mind countless nights and couldn't come up with anything feasible, especially as Jamie Lannister continued to act the steadfast ally that King Aemon claimed he was. The letter she received from Ned had initially been worded in frustration. But then, the letters had taken a turn once they entered the keep. Ned made a point of singing Jamie's praises with his daring raid to capture Renly Baratheon with no bloodshed. It made her wonder if Ned's wine had been spiked. She had written him a letter back, with more than a few words of caution. Ned was becoming too docile in that den. He needed to keep his wits about him, if he and their son was to return with both of their heads intact. It made her itch to travel to King's Landing, to ensure Ned's and Rob's protection. However... Ned was adamant that she stay north. King Aemon has everything under control here. I'm confident in both his and Lord Jaime's abilities to guide the Seven Kingdoms to a peaceful future. It's just a matter of time before they secure the Lord Stannis Baratheons, Dorns, and the Iron Islands Corporation. We'll be heading home in a matter of months. It is good to hear that Bran is doing an admirable job of being Lord of Winterfell. You've done well coaching him. It warms me to hear that Mera and Jojen Reed are there to provide company for him. I know it must be lonely, having to be the Lord of Winterfell, while Rob and I are far away. Rickon sounds like he's getting big. He'll be ready to start training with the sword by the time we return. We may need a new master or arms. Sir Roderick Castle is likely to be serving as a minister at Castle Black for some time. Take care, my love. Ned. Catelyn had smiled faintly at the letter, longing to see Ned once more. It had faded as she read the letter over. Why is Sir Roger Castle serving as ambassador to the Night's Watch? It had puzzled her from the very beginning that King Aemon would venture there first before turning south. Ned had mentioned 
that his great-great-grand-uncle was still the night's watch resident maester. So it seemed obvious that he wished to reconnect with living family. What was less obvious was why he needed all of the heads of the houses to accompany him, when they were better served leading the army to moat Caitlin. Could that have something to do with the long night? She mused. She was there when King Aemon had made his statement against Lord John Umber, seeming to summon the gods' aid to win his battle. She had shivered at the fire in King Aemon's eyes as he brought his sword down and delivered a blow like thunder, cleaving Umber's sword in two. Apart from the gods' blessing, little of interest came from the council. While the king had insisted the gods had bequeathed him with a vision warning of the long night, many still seemed skeptical including her. She was obviously not unfamiliar with the Stark words, but they were simply good advice. Winter, especially here in the North, was never to be trifled with, and preparations were always paramount to surviving a hard winter. Could the Night King truly be waiting north of the Wall? She shook her head, banishing the thought. Night King or no, the Wall is still there, even without the Night's Watch at full strength. The Night King surely can't get past the wall. Ah, Lady Stark. She was interrupted from her thoughts by Maester Lewin. He gave her a slight bow. A letter has arrived for you. Thank you, Maester Lewin, she replied. It seemed odd to receive a letter so soon after the last one Ned sent. She flipped it over and felt the smile slide from her face at the Lannister seal. She looked again at the front to find it was indeed addressed specifically to her. She retired to Ned Solar, holding the parchment out in front of her like she expected it to burst into flame. The Stark's relationship with the Lannisters was cordial for the moment, but she was ready to doubt every single word they'd written. Lord Jamie Lannister had proved himself quite capable in the game of politics, so he had to know that she would relay his words to Ned. She breathed in, stealing herself, and then broke the seal. Lady Catelyn of House Stark, on behalf of House Lannister, I would like to thank you for allowing Joffrey, Marcella, and Juliana Waters to stay as extended guests in your home. A monthly allotment of three hundred gold dragons will be sent to House Stark to cover their expenses. I trust you will continue to provide for them and treat them as you would befit any guest of your house. I was recently informed by King Aemon Targaryen, first of his name, King of the Andals, the Roinar, and the First Men, that he has made arrangements for you to take care of the babe my sister is pregnant with. I expect him, or her, to be treated just as well as the other children. Once the child arrives from Bear Island, the monthly allotment of gold dragons will increase to four hundred gold dragons a month in total. However, I have an extra duty— I wish you to conduct in regards to the babe, and it can only be you. I intend to send letters to the babe, and I want you to read them to him or her. No others may be present when you do this, and you may not disclose the contents of the letters to anyone else. If I should learn that this agreement has been violated, there will be consequences. I await your reply. Lord Jimmy Lannister handed the king. Catelyn's lips were pursed by the time she reached the end, and she felt irritation smoldering in her chests. Who does he think he is demanding such of me? She was to read his letters to his bastard? How insulting. Was he then intending to legitimize this bastard as his heir? He was currently unmarried, but he still was young, and there was almost certainly as many women lining up to court him as King Aemon. She now pitied the poor woman who ended up with him. It had been insulting enough to accept a bastard into her own home, believing that he was born from a woman Ned loved, but to be forced to accept a bastard born of incest by rape? It might be kinder if the gods would relieve the child of life the instant it was born. But J- Aemon had not turned out to be a bastard. She reminded herself. She worked to reel in her temper. At least this one wasn't her husband's. It was simple enough to care for Cersei's ill-begotten bastards. They were old enough to function on their own. 
she had assigned an old maid to be their caretaker, and usually never saw them. It was for the best. Lately, however, the little one, Juliana, enjoyed playing out in the courtyard with Rickon. She allowed it for now, but though Rickon may be two times the spare, she would be damned to allow the little girl to get it into her head to marry the third Stark son. As long as she was breathing, no Stark child of hers would marry anything less than another lord's legitimate child. She was certain she could get Ned to agree with her on this, even if they seemed to agree on little these days. But now, Jamie Lannister seemed intent on insulting her once again, by demeaning her status to care, not only care for a child that was not the family's, but for a bastard. When she finally received the first letter from Eamon, she had instantly returned a letter in protest to Ned. While his words had been gentle, there was a clear warning. Cat, you must do this on behalf of King Aemon and Lord Jamie Lannister. I'm still earning forgiveness from Aemon for not revealing his heritage sooner. Your crimes against him are much more grievous. If you wish to prove your loyalty, then serve your penance by doing this favor. Prove that you can grow and learn from your mistake of mistreating Aemon for so long. It certainly would not do to mistreat Lord Jamie's bastard if the intent was to legitimize him as heir one day. The threat in the letter also got her back up, and it caused her mind to reel. Admittedly, it was vague, and she imagined it was like that for many reasons. What would happen to me? A purging of the Starks like Tywin purged the reins in the Tarbex, or simple denouncement? It wouldn't do for King Aemon's two closest allies to be at odds. It was rather risky to put any kind of threat, vague or not, in the letter. But Jamie Lannister clearly had strong feelings on the matter, and she would be a fool to disregard them. She sighed. Whether she liked it or not, she would be forced to do Lord Jamie's bidding if she did not want to cause trouble for her or Ned. Grudgingly, she pulled out a piece of parchment and wrote a short reply, acquiescing to his demands. It had been eight months since that incident. Cersei's time was near. Cat melted the wax and pressed the stark seal onto the letter, and carried it down to Maester Lewin. She smiled sweetly at him. Please, Maester, send this out at your first available opportunity. Of course, my lady, he replied with a short bow. She was on her way to the glass gardens once more, when the bell started tolling an alarm. Her heart skipped a beat and dashed into the courtyard. She could see the hunt arriving once more, but Bran, he was propped up on a man's horse, a bloody cloth wrapped around his head. Oh, gods, Bran, my baby, what happened? Mira Reed intercepted her as the man worked to pull Bran back down. Apologies, Lady Stark. But there was an incident. We ran into some wildlings. When they attacked, they, they startled Lord Bran's horse. He fell and hit his head on a rock. He's still alive. We've done what we could, she said sheeplessly. I'm truly sorry, my lady. She gasped and followed the men hauling her son inside. What did Bran do to deserve this? Daenerys, four. She stood up and looked towards the trackless sands of the Red Waste from a raised point in the dusty ruins of Vez Torquaro. She had led her Kalasar here, following the red trail of the comet. Her maids had relayed to her that the people felt the comet an ill omen after all that had happened. Perhaps they were right. But there was nowhere else to go. Though she declared them a Kalasar, they were little more than a ragtag band of handful of warriors and a great many slaves. There were other, more powerful Kalasars to the north, Ponyo's Kalasar to the east, and Lachserin to the south. They happened upon this abandoned city. She was glad to take advantage of it to give her people some rest, and also to hide from the sun when they could. Then she had sent her blood riders. Jacharo, Jogo, and Ago, forth to search for help. They'd been gone for a day with no sign of their return. 
I hope they're successful in their efforts, she prayed. In just a few days since the Kalasar had broken apart, many of the slaves had fallen to the elements. She did her best to distribute what they had, but most of those left were old and enfeebled. They lacked the necessary manpower to carry those who could not carry themselves, and were forced to leave their bodies in the dust. If they did not find a path soon, then Vase del Haro would likely turn into their graveyard. The only ones who did not seem perturbed by the circumstances were the dragons. They playfully snapped at each other and scampered around the ruins, rooting through the cracks and crevices for what she assumed must be bugs. Although it had been a few days since their birth, watching them left her with an unreal feeling. Beasts that had been extinct for two hundred years were now stumbling around like kittens. Though they lacked for many resources, she doted on them. They will undoubtedly be our saviors, she thought. She was the only one in the world with dragons. They were a curiosity that many would like to see, and she could use that to her advantage. Daenerys broke off a piece of meat from her meal to grab the dragon's attention. They clambered over to her, making a crooning noise that she assumed was used to beg for food. She tossed it, and the black dragon leapt off his feet to snatch it out of the air. She named him Drogon. She could tell that he was already bigger, swifter, and had a more domineering personality. He also frequently perched himself in a way that reminded her of Drogo sitting on his horse, regal and dangerous. It had been an easy fit. The cream-colored one had been less easy to name. She considered naming him after her brother Rhaegar, but unlike Drogon, nothing she could recall about Rhaegar seemed to fit. He was gentle, soothing, and an intellectual. While she could see intelligence in his eyes, she saw nothing about the cream dragon to suggest he would be anything soothing or gentle. They're dragons. Viserys would probably be a more apt name. Just even thinking about her brother brought such a rage that she had to close her eyes and clear her thoughts of him to stop the shaking in her hands. She breathed in and out slowly, willing her heart to slow its frantic pace. No, her dragons did not make her angry so she would not name them after one who did. Then she considered her father's name, Eris. But much like Viserys, the little she had heard of the Mad King sounded like something she should not bequeath to her dragon. She also considered names of past dragons, but it deserved its own name to characterize it. She was drawn back to her earlier assessment of the dragons acting like kittens. They were curious and playful, and engaged in antics of a baby. My niece died when she was little more than a babe. She loved cats, and had a kitten named Valerian, she thought and smiled wistfully. I shall name you Rahelion. She did not live long enough to leave her mark, but you shall carry on her legacy. She held out the piece to him, and he took it gently from her, snapping it up eagerly. Khaleesi. She turned to see Sir Jorah Marmont climbing up to her. By contrast to the others, he seemed almost invigorated by the dire circumstances they were in. Though he had fought hard and nearly died defending her against Rogo's blood riders, the healing that Marie Mazdor had provided him must have actually worked. She had no bones to pick with him, she thought, with no small amount of anger. But Marie Mazdor had apparently been under the impression of doing her a favor. If I may, Khaleesi, have you thought about what will happen when you reunite with your nephew, King Aemon? Danny stared at him inquisitively. She studied him for a moment, and then shook her head. She had been consumed by her losses, and bent on keeping the Kalasar alive. Returning to Westeros, returning to the last living family member she had, had always been a desire, but she didn't see how life could get any worse. Sir Jorah, you yourself said he was unlikely to be cruel. I also said that he did not appear Targaryen, he said. He looked at her dragons with undisguised fear. He might try to take your dragons from you. She stiffened. 
but they're mine. I hatched them. They see me as their mother. They will not accept another. Sir Jorah shrugged. You won't be queen, Khaleesi. He will marry you off, just like your brother did. She stared at her dragons, but didn't see them. Would she be forced to marry a Westerosi noble once more, and without a say? She felt her shoulders tightening at the prospect, and her jaw clenched. Hadn't she suffered enough under the whims of others? I wish to control my destiny. What would you have me do? He's the only family I have left. I'm not saying you shouldn't go, but you should be prepared for any eventuality, he replied earnestly, and she said nothing, still staring at her dragons. Khaleesi. I will think on what we do next. He's still my family, and I wish to meet him, she declared. I may change how we meet, she mused. <laughs>